thank you all so much for joining us to celebrate carceral liberalism, feminist voices against state violence. My name is Heather and I'm the senior publicity manager at the University of Illinois Press. And I'm just gonna go over some brief logistical information and introduce our guests before we get started. First of all, thank you so much to our panelists for being here today. They're gonna to talk for about 45 minutes and then we will have time for a 15 minute Q&A at the end. You can enter questions throughout the event by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A 40% off discount code and a link to the book on our website can be found in the chat box. I'll put it in there after I'm done speaking. We will also be recording the event and posting it on our YouTube channel afterwards. You'll receive an email from Zoom after the event that will put the discount code and a link to our YouTube channel as well. And now I will just briefly introduce our guest. Sharika Pillay is the Associate Dean of the College of Human Sciences and Humanities and Professor of Humanities at the University of Houston Clear Lake. Pillay teaches undergraduate and graduate students on campus and in prison for the Transforming Lives by Degrees program. Tamita Fraser is an activist, independent scholar, thought leader, writer, and educator. She is a co-founder of the Combe Heap River Collective and a radical black feminist organization active in Boston from 1975 to 1981 and co-author of the Combe Heap River Collective Statement, a foundational black feminist primer. Elka Kurian is an associate teaching professor at the University of Washington Bothell. Kurian is a recipient of the 2020 Fulbright U.S. Scholar Award to Morocco, the board president of Tesfir, director of the Tesfir South Asian Literary Festival, and host of the podcast South Asian Films and Books. Beth Matsuoff Murfish is an associate professor of art history and department chair of global arts at the University of Houston Clear Lake. Murfish's research and previous publications center on Mexico City as a site of global anti-fascism and fascism during the Second World War. Maria F. Curtis is a professor of anthropology and cross-cultural and global studies at the University of Houston Clear Lake. She has worked with, with the Arab American National Museum on projects that seek to tell the story of recent Arab immigration to the United States and on increasing awareness about archival collections in Arab American communities in the Southern US. Autumn Elizabeth is a contributor to the Alternative Justices Project, launched in 2015, which is run by a decentralized collective of activists and scholars. They have an MA from the University of Paris Diderot and University of Bamberg. Pancho Aguelas co-founded the Faye Justico Worker Center, served as the executive director of Living Hope Wheelchair Association, served on the board for the National Network for Immigrant and Refugee Rights, and is co-chair of the Highlander Research and Education Center Board. Currently, he is the director is the Senior Director for Network and Power Building with the Practice Pro Praxis Project. Joanna L. Thoreau is a contributing editor at ASSE, a journal of nonfiction studies, and teaches at Christopher Newport University and the writing workshops in Greece. She is the author of the essay collection, This Way Back. I just want to apologize. I think I butchered a couple of people's names, so I apologize <laughs> for that. Um, and without further ado, I will turn it over to our panelists. Thanks again to everyone for being here today. All right, so Demita Frazier here. I hope you can all hear me. I have to be masked because there are workers working here in our place and they refuse to mask. So two of them are coughing like mad. I just want to say I am incredibly excited to be a part of this conversation and particularly incredibly um, honored to be a part of the book project. One of the things about having a long life as an activist is because you're constantly being, um, you're deepening your understanding of issues that you may have been initially involved with as a young person, over time, the sort of sociological and socioeconomic changes in the country around you and in the world also continue to add to that understanding and knowledge. So it was really fortuitous when I met um, Shurika Pillai because we completely connected on this notion of what it means to continue with the idea of interrogating the carceral state and, and supporting people who are inside. Um, I'm incredibly touched by the idea that when we think about the carceral state, because it's an ongoing project, because it's been a project of the United States since its inception, and because it mutates and changes form, but in fact expands and increases in who it ensnares, and which includes nearly all of us, if not all of us in one way or another. So this book I think is incredibly timely. I think that one of the things that really has inspired me as I've read again, read through the contributions of the authors is 
the importance of recognizing the variety of viewpoints, the perspectives that come from such an array of places, but also the connectivity of it all through the understanding of the need for compassion, deep understanding, and caring for people whose lives are not that different than many of our own, as we used to say, and we don't tend to now small g, but with the grace of God, go any of us. So I feel um, incredibly honored, as I said, to have been asked to write this forward. The chance to continue um, acting as an activist and being engaged in work that's meaningful for not simply self, but for us as a society, totally. I'm just very excited and I'm thrilled and very grateful again to U of I Press for picking up the cudgel in the midst of the pandemic and carrying this book forward and getting it finally in the hands of people. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Domita. Uh, it's just, uh, I'm just so glad you're here. And um, I am just so grateful for, for everything that you have done for, for this book, for being you, for your powerful work um, and, and your solidarity with all of us and with me in particular. Uh, and for the audience here, I want to say that the work of Kambahi River Collective informs this work in very deep and profound ways. And the women of the Kambahi were meeting for years in order to put their statement together that possibly from 74 to 77, at least from what I know from the historical records. And they were struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual class oppression and providing an integrated analysis and practice against major systems of interlocking oppression. And for me, this has been a citational strategy that is my, I had a need to center my work and my scholarship on the labor, intellectual labor and activist labor performed by radical black feminists of the 1970s. So for me, Kambahi was a pathfinder and finding Demita has been uh, really <laughs> phenomenal for me. Um, and along with Kambahi, for me, I have been reading for the last decade and more uh, scholars uh, such as Michelle Alexander, Sarah Benson, Angela Davis, uh, Paulo Freire, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, Marie Gottschalk, um, Elizabeth Hinton, Audre Lorde, Erica Miners, Robert Perkinson, Asada Shakur, Julia Sudbury, Kianga Yamada Taylor, Loi Wakwan, just to kind of give you a little taste of the of the bibliography that's been in my head all these years. And for me, this book has been an act of bearing witness uh, as a woman, as a brown academic in primarily white institutions, uh, to witnessing anti-Blackness at work, anti-woman uh, woman, uh, at work, and anti-worker uh, ideologies at work. And I've also had the privilege for the last 15 years, 16 years of working here at University of Houston Clear Lake as faculty and also teaching in our prison classroom, as uh, was explained in the introduction, we call our program Transforming Lives by Degrees. And the prison classroom has really informed the conceptualization of this book for me. And what I really wanted to um, uh, speak on is the fact that um, there is this kind of confusion and slipperiness between in our public culture in the words such as liberal, liberalism, neoliberalism. And so when we think liberal, just to quickly uh, unpack that, we think social, li liberal uh, ideas, political parties, and we think of liberalism as sort of the political and moral philosophy of enlightenment, which really founds modern history of the last several hundred years. Um, and we think of quick catchphrases like rights of individuals, that there's consent of the governed, we have right to private property, equality before law, liberty, and such things. And what we find is, of course, as this liberal liberalism informs the formation of the modern states, uh, we go from the liberalism of the 19th century into something that by the late 20th century becomes neoliberalism, which is really uh, uh, rather like sounds like a homonym, but it isn't really because it is about the limitation of democracy and freedom in many ways, because uh, there are uh, political and economic institutions that are more 
offer a limited democracy and a more modest welfare state uh, that is deeply capitalist, right, at its core. So that's neoliberalism. And what I'm coming up with uh, coining is carceral liberalism, which in many ways lays bare the problematics inherent in a system that promises life and liberty, but is really founded on confining, oppressing, and from the birth of the nation state here in the United States, it's founded on chattel slavery, colonialism, imperialism. So, uh, so when you add together neoliberalism with the carceral state and patriarchy, uh, we have a new subscript for freedom. And in that subscript, we see this material embodied conditions of the many are far less uh, than the system symbolizes. So there are limitations, exclusions that are woven into the apparatus of the state. And that's just kind of in a little nutshell, carceral liberalism. And I do write a chapter on the popular show, Orange is the New Black, um, which is a celebrated <laughs> show. And then I'm trying to unpack the problematics of that celebrated show once it's serialized and televised. Uh, so this edited volume came together at the National Women's Studies Conference in 2017, when we had the younger activists meeting the elder activists such as Kambahi. And that a conference was really pivotal for me. And that's where I pulled together this panel. And then there was a call for papers. And what is really special about this book is the combination as Demita Frazier speaks about. It's a book that includes academics, activists, poets, nonfiction writing, and there is something in it for everybody. It might not, all the chapters might not speak to everybody, but there is something in it for literally every single person who reads on this planet. Uh, so for me, I'm hoping that this book opens doors where there were only walls. And because it is a book on carcerality, I'm hoping that there are walls that come tumbling down. And this is of course me paying homage to Toni Morrison who speaks about making windows where there are only walls. So I hope that um, you enjoy listening to all my many powerful contributors and that this book makes you think of the nature of freedom in free societies. Thank you. And Autumn, you are up. Great, good morning or afternoon. I'm on the West Coast, it's still <laughs> solidly morning over here, but good, good morning, afternoon to everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, uh, I'm Autumn Elizabeth. I am part of the Decentralized Collective um, that uh, stewards the Alternative Justices Project. I'm an activist, a writer, and a scholar. And um, we took collectively, as our collective wrote, the Resisting Criminalizations chapter in this book. And that chapter really focuses on um, the Alternative Justices Project, the theory of alternative justices, which really takes um, a number of other theories, transformative justice, uh, restorative justice, anarchist criminology, and, and kind of molds them together in a way that is allows communities to develop their own toolkits, their own methodologies, because we firmly believe that communities know the best ways to keep ourselves safe, the best ways to transform the harms that happen in our own communities, and that we are the experts, not the state. And I think that for me, the really amazing thing about this collection was that we wrote our chapter sort of like somewhat in isolation. We're not all like hanging out together. And the chapter that we wrote is a lot, like I said, about the multiplicity of viewpoint. We draw from experiences of uh, people who've experienced incarceration for a long time where connected with the Second Life Project, which is um, people who've been released from life sentences, and they inform our theory, they give us that their wisdom is fully in here. And so we have all this multiplicity behind in our chapter. And what was so amazing is, as you know, everyone has said so far, this book isn't of itself that multiplicity of viewpoint. There is poetry, and there is um, really high academic stuff that is, you know, even myself as an academic has to kind of get out my like little dictionary <laughs> and find some words and, and look things up. And then there's memoir and really moving pieces about activist points of view and, and activist experiences that sort of like touch all of us. And it is constantly informed by the experiences of those who've been directly impacted by incarceration, which I think is so vital because we, you know, we're breaking down that idea that like we can theorize, like I'm not a person who's been directly impacted by incarceration. And so we're breaking down the idea that I have the expertise, we're kind of including everyone. And I 
really think that this book is so not only readable by, as, as Reka said, like anyone who reads, um, but also imminently teachable, which I think is so important in this moment in history and in the United States, especially where we're talking about education and, and the war on educating young people. I think there's something in here that can be taught to any anyone, um, including children, honestly. Um, I have a small child here that I'm stewarding and I think there's lessons <laughs> for everyone. And so I just think this volume literally embodies what what it theorizes, right? It is praxis and theory together. And I think that is so rare in academic books, but really in lots of books um, that I think it, it makes this volume really special. And I'm super honored to be a part of this and super honored to be on this panel with these amazing, amazing people. And um, I just think that um, it is a gift to be able to read this book, to be able to teach this book, to be able to talk about this book, to be able to experience this this book. So um, with that, I'm actually going to pass this to Maria Curtis, who wrote the chapter Vacant Refuge Unfinished Resettlement. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so good to um, be with all of you. Um, I can't really say thank you enough to Shrika. Uh, this has been an amazing project, um, one that was not easy to manage in the first place, but certainly not made any easier by a pandemic. <laughs> and of course, um, certainly want to thank Demita, who's been, um, you know, who, without your work, Demita, I'm not really sure I would have been able to write this chapter or to really think about a lot of things, if I'm, if I'm being honest. So thank you all so much. Um, I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about my chapter. Um, I had been, um, I, I teach at the University of Houston Clear Lake. I teach anthropology and cross-cultural studies. And um, Houston is one of these really unique cities that welcomes people from all over the world. And, and we had, um, been, I think, very lucky to call ourselves a sanctuary city for a number of years. Um, I had been working very closely with um, Syrian and Iraqi, uh, mostly women. Um, um, I started out kind of volunteering um, as, as, a, as an English teacher, and then over time, the group of people that I um, was working with got smaller as um, men tended to enter the workforce and so on. I started to spend a lot of time with women and their children and also elderly people who were who were not able to join the workforce. Um, so it's kind of volunteering, teaching, and then also working on a larger project with the Arab American National Museum, wherein I was tasked with um, trying to capture some new voices. We were, we, we had been um, kind of in Arab American studies, we had been thinking about these three waves of, um, of immigration and then trying to give some kind of shape to um, the, the migration from Iraq, particularly um, and, and Syria over the last several decades. Um, so my chapter um, looks at um, the lives of, of women and, and children and those that we would consider um, certainly the most vulnerable of the vulnerable, if you will. Um, and the, the timing of this was, was quite interesting. Um, I had been working with them um, starting in 2015 and um, you know, through the end of the Obama administration through the earlier part of uh, the Trump administration when Obama had requested um, an increase in the cap set for refugees, which really hadn't um, changed much um, since the Vietnam era, since the 70s. Um, it was a very, very modest request compared to uh, you know, what we were seeing in terms of other European countries, which were um, granting sanctuary and so on. Um, Although his request was denied, uh, and you know, it, we ended up with this thing called the Muslim ban. Um, what we were seeing here in Houston was that you know, Houston and, and Texas in general were sort of like ground zero for um, the creation of, of this logic of um, something that could be considered a Muslim ban, right? Um, 
uh, so I, you know, in spending time with women, uh, you know, I got to hear about um, these institutions that were ostensibly set up to support them. Um, you know, this, this vetting system, if you will, the vetting system itself had, had been drawn into presidential debates and there were um, a lot of blurring of lines about whether or not refugees deserve refugee status and um, were they really terrorists and, and you know, um, you know, so it was, it was, um, you know, difficult, of course, to, to be with people who were um, just entering the country looking for safety um, and then sort of being asked to bear this, this weight of kind of a, a 9-11 sort of, um, you know, baggage, which they had nothing to do with and so on. Uh, so my, my chapter traces, you know, some of the institutional um, challenges they face as they're, um, you know, shepherding kids through schools, and many of them had, um, you know, multiple children, sometimes in elementary, middle, and high school with, you know, start and finish times that were, that made it completely impossible for them to really do, um, you know, English classes or, or to get involved or to, or, or to work. So they did feel, um, you know, I guess, you know, the many layers of, of these challenges did feel like a sort of carceral experience um, for sure. Um, you know, they had to deal with seeing themselves through a lens where their, their clothing styles really, you know, set them apart. Um, they weren't prepared for having like their daughters bullied in school and, you know, what is this about? Um, so, you know, um, the, these are some of the challenges that they faced um, on a regular basis. Um, one of the more surprising ones had to do with um, not allow, not being able to let your children play unattended. This was something that was completely new. Uh, the idea that outdoors, outside, um, could be dangerous unless you know there's a, a parent surveilling children all the time. Um, the idea that um, without the proper documentation, um, you know, for a child's absence, you could be fined or even taken to court and so on. So these are things that they were really um, struggling with, struggling to understand. Um, one thing that became, I guess, the heart of the chapter for me is um, watching older waves of, um, you know, older immigrant groups, if you will, um, having supported the, the newer groups and, and watching the ways in which um, humans very creatively overcome all sorts of challenges to mobility or immobility and um, ways that they created community um, in some instances when they're unable to really leave their homes or to participate in, in English classes or go to other things they might've wanted to do. They built these online communities of support, which were really, um, I think, very nourishing for them and which um, served as this community um, that they would have drawn on sort of uh, back home from their, their, their neighbors and, and family members and so on. So uh, in a nutshell, that's what my chapter is about. And um, again, it's so great to be here with everyone. And thank you. I'm going to pass. Um, the baton on to Alka Kurian. Look forward to hearing about your chapter. Thank you so much. Um, it gives me a lot of pleasure to to be in this forum, and um, many many thanks to um, Sri Rekha for um, for all her patience and vision and leadership and and um, persistence. Um, without which we wouldn't be here. Uh, would it be possible for me to share my screen? Um, yeah, okay. Um, right. So I basically want to talk about uh, my contribution to this book, um, which is about uh, the which is the Pindrathor movement. Um, the Pindrathor movement, as you can see, um, is very much embodied um, uh, in the shape of a resistance campaign against. Um, um, you know, perceived and, and and long internalized idea of Indian femininity, which is, as you can see, is you know understood in the shape of this uh, eternally suffering Indian woman, uh, where the power of the woman lies in her suffering and uh, and marginalization. 
and as you can see in these um in these other um, images, uh, the um, the emphasis is on sort of really breaking free from this cage of Indian womanhood. But I think this all happened at a time uh, which is very much part of a global resurgence of uh, a feminist movement, which is different from uh, previous iterations of feminist movements, um, in particular in India, where um, where the feminist the mainstream feminist campaign was very much aligned with the statist understanding of Indian femininity, uh, which mm. was couched in a, a discourse of moralism and everything. Um, and so it sort of breaks mm. away from that iteration of or those versions of feminist movements in order to sort of um, bring the conversation back to the to the whole idea of the female body, to the whole idea of autonomy, to the whole idea of uh, of freedom and, and and a departure from previous versions and understandings of Indian femininity that ended up caging women in all sorts of walls, whether it's domestic walls or professional walls, um, moralistic walls, etc. So the Pinjra Thor movement really is against, as I was mentioning, uh, moral policing, feminist gatekeeping, feminist women's infantilization, um, and a, a hike in discriminatory, discriminatory hostile fees. Hostile, in fact, it should be hot, not mm. hostile. It's hostile fees. So you can see um, this um, powerful representation of female rage, um, women's rage against uh, a variety of uh, constrictions placed on their on 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 their understanding of their lives. Um, so that tour is about the ways in which freedom is not just about sexual liberation because. In the previous versions, in the previous versions of feminist, um, um, uh, or the previous sort of feminist campaigns, most of them sort of tended to focus on sexual liberation, and that too it was like quite complicated in the ways in which sexual liberation was understood only through the lens of sexual violence or through the lens of, um, um, you know, economic through uh, or read through the lens of um, developmental economics. So it wasn't just about sexual liberation. Um, it's an autonomous feminist movement against sexist university poli policies, an autonomous movement for respect and and freedom for women students in in university campaigns, against women's infantilization in the name of their safety, um, through sexist curfews, regressive dress codes, and moral policing. Uh, because these policies, as I just mentioned, um, restrict women's mobility and access to university facilities and undermines their growth and agency as responsible individuals, uh, where women, you know, um, articulated the ways in which they were tired of being caged inside hostels and monitored as good or bad women, rapeable and unrapeable bodies. Uh, I also see this campaign um, uh, as a, a rejection of the Hind of the Hindu rights imagination of India, uh, India, which has historically been um, uh, and still continues to con continues to be a pluralistic nation, and ha which has historically been imagined as a homogenized and singular nation. Um, uh, sorry, historically been a pluralistic nation, but the Hindu right wishes to imagine it as a homogenized and singular nation with strictly defined boundaries for minorities and particularly for women, uh, where the Hindu right uh, wishes to imagine a constitutionally, a historically, constitutionally and constitutionally secular India as a Hindu nation, a multilingual India um, as a Hindi dominant nation. Uh, and this Hindu right, um, um, th th this this um, Hindutva uh, nation, which is an expression for the for Hindu supremacy, this Hindu right nation is deeply in, um, uh, it sort of deeply intersects with its imagination, specifically of the ways in which it undermines women's agency through its domestication, control, policing, and violence in private spaces. Um, where women's unjustified presence in public uh, is in in the public sphere is seen as an act of provocation, and penalized through threat and reality of sexual and other forms of um, uh, other forms of um, um, of um, sorry, um, I just got distracted because I just got a, tag, a message from Rekha that I only have thirty seconds. Okay, so but I also wanted to very quickly talk about the ways in which there are cracks in this movement where marginalized communities feel misrepresented by the Pindra Thor movement. So I'm going to just stop uh, um, sharing this. And I wanted to sort of uh, say the ways in which 
my chapter is very much in the at the core of this conversation around um, carceral carceral um, state, um, in particular the ways in which Sri Rekha identified this and theorized it in her book. Thank you. Okay, I think I'm next. Okay, um, this picture, yes. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm so grateful to be included in this conversation and to be included in the book. I was a, a rather late addition um, and benefited from um, Rika's really expansive view of, of this kind of work um, and her um, very intentional uh, form of inclusion and practice of inclusion. Um, and so I, I feel grateful. And I think those um, characteristics of her work are also very clear in the book. So, so there's a really sort of beautiful reflection in there for me. Um, uh, my chapter is about the Texas Prison Museum um, and the way in which it uh, both overtly and sometimes subtly uh, reinforces a false binary of an us versus them, um, where um, the us is those of us um, living in the free world, um, including and often catering to correctional officers um, within the museum. Um, and the the them is sort of those who are or have been incarcerated, um, including the incarcerated people who have been um, executed by the state of Texas. Um, and and building, um, as Reka already said, she does um, on the wisdom of scholars like Michelle Alexander. I point out in the conclusion to my chapter that this is a false dichotomy. Um, none of us lives in a monolithic community that is entirely discreet um, from those who have spent time incarcerated, from the families of those who have spent time incarcerated. Um, and and so I, I spend time sort of looking at that, at the way in which that dichotomy is constructed by a public institution like the museum um, and the ways in, in which it is false. Um, and as I've been sort of reflecting for today and, and thinking, um, I've been um, thinking about the need to actually define what the difference is um, between um, these groups, because while there is no us and them, there are two different groups um, I might refer to. And um, uh, I would say there's a difference between a group um, that is aware each day of the impact of the carceral system on their lives um, and a group who is able to proceed um, relatively oblivious to the impact of that system. Um, and there are clear um, racial divisions. I think it's important to point out in those groups sort of who gets to live oblivious um, to the uh, kind of totality of the carceral system and who doesn't get to live um, oblivious to that. Um, there's clearly um, racial privilege at play and other forms of privilege. Um, and so I thought what I would think about today is um, kind of the thread of, of that privilege, um, the privilege of allowing a system of power um, to remain invisible to you um, versus the, the disadvantage of having that power constantly made visible to you um, and its impacts constantly made concrete for you and tangible. Um, and and I, I think about that because I'm coming out of the field of museum studies. Um, and this has a really compelling parallel within museum studies, um, where those who are educated within certain narratives of cultural production um, often visit a museum um, and see their um, often false narratives reinforced for them. Um, so if I'm thinking about fine arts museums, which is where I emerge from, um, the division between the so-called East and the so-called West, um, the myth of a direct line between classical democracy and our own world today, um, the myth um, of the production of art divorced from commerce and hegemony and systems of power, right? These are all myths um, that are often reinforced for those who are, who are privileged within a museum. Um, those who exist outside of that realm of privilege, on the other hand, often see the museum as imposing, as intimidating, as unwelcoming, um, because of the overwhelming imposition of power it represents um, and because of the exclusions that it often hides, um, that it, uh, museums often present what seems like a seamless encyclopedic narrative. Um, and in doing so, they both erase um, cultures, peoples, objects, practices, and also erase the fact that they are erasing it or hide the fact that they're erasing it. Um, and I, I just thought um, so much of, of my work on the chapter was informed by my own teaching experience in our TLD program. Um, and so I thought I would, I would share for you just a quick anecdote to sort of finish up um, about the parallels between sort of the museum um, and the, the carceral institution and sort of another way in which I see this. And um, that is that um, I had the privilege of teaching an MA course um, that ended up being a museum studies course, um, which was a fascinating thing to do. It's fascinating to teach museum studies um, to people who will not have the opportunity to visit um, those institutions and, and critique them through a visit. Um, and some of the reading that we did is some some pretty 
um, foundational theory about museums, um, particularly the what are called the princely collections, or sort of the original European um, museums, um, including the Louvre and the the notion that um, the Louvre is a display of power, that each time a new regime took power in France after the establishment of the Louvre, um, a building, a, a room would be repainted, right, um, with um, a, a mural or a ceiling decoration which celebrated that regime. Um, and when we talked about that, my students in my MA course who were incarcerated um, all started laughing. And, and I sort of said, what's, you know, what's the joke? And they said, oh, that makes a lot of sense because every time we have a new warden, we have to paint the whole prison doesn't matter if we painted it last. <laughs> we have to repaint the whole thing every time. Um, and so it was so striking to me, right? Like um, it was it was such mm -hmm. a, a revelatory moment in so many ways about the the intersections, um, the the commonalities in the way that power functions, um, even in uh, what might seem from the outside like very different institutions. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to say again how grateful I am for the opportunity to contribute to this book um, because I think it's an opportunity to do what is really required of people of conscience. Um, which is to disallow that privilege of invisible systems of power um, to make them visible so that they can be analyzed, criticized, um, and I hope dismantled. So thank you again for this opportunity. Um, and I am really excited to hear from Joanna next. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. And I'm going to read from a creative essay called These Stories Will Not Be Confined. That's based on the privilege I had of also teaching our uh, incarcerated students in Texas and the thinking, I'd be happy to answer questions in the Q&A about the, the thinking behind the essay. These stories will not be confined. The unit lies an hour's drive south from my downtown home, and the terrain grows pastoral as I drive each week toward the creative writing course my university offers there. From their pasture, cows stare placidly at my speeding car. Palms, Rose Bay, and oaks sway if there's a wind. Always the sky is big. A sign says hitchhikers may be escaping inmates. I spot white uniforms of incarcerated men working the land. They bounce along on tractors or bend over crops. After the fields plowed by men in white, I pass rows of houses and park. And then a high wall of gleaming concertina wire rises above me, taller even than the watchtower. Its coiled razors are beautiful. They reflect sunshine, even on gloomy days, but when the sun glares, they look wildly bright, and I am torn in my admiration as I wait to be admitted. The shimmering coils are instruments, not exactly of torture, but certainly of control. And I address some of the men I met in the second person, in a struggling struggle with how to talk about people who, as we've discussed, don't have the power I do to speak publicly. I am more than my crimes, you wrote, and you, B, offered an example to me of what it looks like to be free from a solipsistic insistence on self-blame and perfectionism. B, your essay made me cry, not because you had suffered, you fell from a dangerous machine while working on the prison farm and were hospitalized for weeks, but because you owned up to your offenses. I have destroyed many lives with my actions, you wrote, but I am more than my crimes and I disturb to be loved. Built like a mid-distance runner, broad-shouldered and lean with a baby face and carefully gelled hair, you appear too young to have had all the adventures you catalog in your memoirs. You said little in class, but certain in some of the boldest student work. You described your teenage self as the middle-class parent's nightmare, the kid that was given everything but just didn't care. You wrote of joy rides in expensive cars, terrible accidents, and more stupid risk. Somehow in prison, you decided to change. I am not the man I was. You learned what many of us still struggle to believe that our humanity is sacred and that our bodies are a gift. This year, you wrote about the Texas Department of Corrections decision to rescue the unit's mattresses from Hurricane Harvey first before you. The human beings locked inside the unit came next after water had already entered their cells and after it was certain that this was a storm that would cost human beings their lives. You chose the title, What is a Life Worth? understated and intelligent, 
your essay asks readers to reckon with their complicity in the prison industrial complex as you describe those rescued mattresses and the inmates left behind, water seeping into their cinder block cage. Is my mattress worth more than my life? The front yard of the R unit is immaculately manicured. Pink roses are well pruned and someone, certainly an inmate, has shaped the hedges beautifully as if this were his one shot at making a work of art. Someone has raked the leaves. To the left as I enter, there's a little well with a round wall, a bucket, and a sloping roof. Usually another inmate is mopping the steps when I enter the unit and always, Always, he holds the door for me. I wait at the next door. The foyer always smells aggressively clean, antiseptic, like an unsanitary hospital, de desperate to stamp out disease. I have used this smell as an example when I teach the writers about telling sensory detail. What this detail tells us, I explain, is how hard our society has tried to purge itself of people like you. My papers and books are tucked under my arm, visible, and a clear plastic baggie holds my board markers and pens. I clutch the tools of my trade and hold my faculty ID before me to say all at once, I'm supposed to be here and it's my job and also I don't belong here, I'm only here for the day. For me, the most frightening thing about entering a prison isn't the presence of felons, but the precarity of my own freedom. Before, I used to dismiss the carceral system as an ancillary aspect of society. But once I passed into this place, I was changed, and I would forever know that captivity is the consequence of making too serious a mistake. Thank you. Pancho. Get up. Yes, I'm still transitioning for that powerful contribution. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Reika, for your stubbornness and perseverance to see <laughs> the project to the end and your patience. And uh, all my sisters here uh, for your voices. I come, uh, I was raised in the movement, in the tradition of the theology of liberation movement. I started in Chiapas 40 years ago. And your chapters and your words and your work make me think of this thing that is told in Theology of Liberation about the need to be a prophetic voice in the tradition of the Old Testament, a voice that denounces uh, oppression and announces a world where all people have all rights and, and all, pe all people's sacred nature and all all being sacred nature is honor and acknowledge you know so in different ways your articles are these prophetic voices denouncing not a broken system but actually talking about a system that is not broken is doing exactly what it was designed to do day in and day out criminalizing entire populations and putting brown and black and women bodies and trans bodies in cages for profit for economic and electoral profit. Let's not forget the electoral profit, the political profit, the posturing that has criminalized something as natural as humanity, which is human mobility. Maria Jimenez, our friend and mentor here in Houston, an incredible human rights activist and intellectual that we miss every day because she passed away two or three years ago. She always call attention to the fact that it, it is the working poor who are criminalizing their mobility. Capital moves freely and the, and the rich move freely and the working poor pay with their lives. And in my chapter, I was gonna write about a case that I was involved with uh, suing the police chief in uh, Lake City here in Texas on behalf and with a group of day laborers, Mayan indigenous day laborers who were being harassed and arrested. And in some cases, while they were in prison, they were get by eyes in what we call a polymigra, this collaboration, this perverse collaboration between immigration and police. And they were deported and we will never hear from them again. And this group organized and 
later we got the support from Maldives and ended suing uh, Lake City Police Department and, and won. And but that victory didn't really feel like a victory because the system is still there and they didn't really get justice. They didn't get their money back and people were not brought back. But when trying to write about this, I realized I, I just called on. It was very painful. And I ended writing about this notion of how when you carry the anger, the rage, the guilt, the shame for all these lost battles, your heart becomes a minefield. And because Ray invited me to hang out with poems, with poets, which I don't usually do, to my surprise, even a poem emerged in my chapter. I was the more surprised of that. Um, but the, probably the, the arriving point, it is that we live in a world that not designed for us or by us when our humanity is constantly in question in this part of the ocean for the last 500 years has been under question for people who have been here way before borders and then for people who were abducted from Africa and then everywhere like for women is constantly humanity is constantly contested so it is a challenge for us to devise and find ways to be constantly connecting to our own humanity that's why I have Ali Alejandro in fact to remind me to be <laughs> Paying attention to alienation, no? this fundamental separation of our humanity, and, uh, and this this possibility to accompany and be in solidarity with this day labor, it was essential for me to see their dignity, their solidarity in a system that is so profoundly, profoundly unfair uh, and loves to pass itself as a real democracy when it has never been one. Truly, right. for a lot of people in this right. country. So, uh, I want to again say thank you and uh, and connect to that call, like to do what we can to keep uplifting human dignity, being solidarity, being joy, and remember that, especially in these days, what we do is not enough, but we are enough. And there is a call to find the courage to acknowledge that that we are constantly ignoring. And sometimes that is very relevant right now. And then there is a, a discipline to recognize, reorganize our cognition in a way that includes the pain of those who are I'm used to see as the others. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Pancho. Thank you so much. Um, so I have had the privilege of knowing some of these contributors for a long time, such as Pancho, and I've been watching his human rights work in Houston and all of the different places he travels to. Uh, and I always felt like he's not, even though he's always on the road, I have always thought that he needs to travel more. So my thought was <laughs> by including him in the book, he is traveling all everywhere all the time. And that's the power of books, border crossing, mm -hmm. radical work. Uh, so please, we have a few minutes left. Uh, my contributors are all incredible. I hope your voice, their voices were compelling. So please um, let me um, let us have some questions from the people who are attending here. And I, I'm not sure if I'm seeing any just. And we also have questions that we have been thinking about with one another. And one of the key questions that came up while we wait for comments is um, we were interested in how we can make this book accessible to audiences within universities and schools and also beyond in all different circles uh, because there's a power to great circulation. Uh, and that's a question that many of us have been wondering, like now that we have done the hard work of putting this book together, how do we, how do we, um, along with the press's work, how do we bring walls down and have this be read? And we have also a question uh, that if we can speak to some of the concerns we had when we were assembling this book. Mm. Yeah, so. Mm. And Demira, do you wanna jump in with something? You know, of course I've got a thousand thoughts and I wanted to mm -hmm. say, first of all, <laughs> what can I say? Ironically, the labor, when we were laboring to pull this book together in the midst of the pandemic, 
it was so revealing to me the way we were all being kept inside and the struggles that we were going through in our own individual mundane lives to try to cope with what was happening, which I didn't really think about how aligned it was with my cousin who's in prison in Mississippi and another person I know who's also in, in Mississippi who's in prison and the things that they were talking about and writing about in their little letters back and forth and saying, you know, so one of them actually said, now you all know what we're experiencing. And I thought, well, that's interesting because I read, I read pretty widely, I, you know, and I'm like the guardian. I don't read about that perspective in terms of that time. But when you look at the behaviors of humanity around the whole thing, it's very revealing. So I had to say two things. I wanted to say, and I think it's echoing Beth and other people who have also said, the thing that's or maybe not. The thing that's magical for me about this book is that it can be taught in a multitude of settings. And it lends itself to critique to being critiqued in a multitude of settings, which is always, I think, really good positive critiquing. The other thing I wanted to say, though, is that I feel like one of the things I want to do as an educator is use this book in the freedom school model that I'm trying to get off the ground. And uh, I've done several beta tests in different locales, different organizations. People love the idea because ongoing adult learning when you do it right is just life changing for people in so many ways. So I thought about the fact that there are so many ways that Pancho's chapter, um, Reka's chapter, um, just each, book, each, each chapter lends itself to being explicated and taught at levels that really will have an impact on the communities that are looking at the subject. So I, I'm just, and also amazing that we all cohered. I think it's pretty amazing with this diversity of viewpoints, life experiences, everything, that somehow this came together, I think it's you, Reka, mm -hmm. to make it cohere and to mm -hmm. give it really the sense that, someone said it earlier, something here for everyone, mm -hmm. literally. Yes. And I want to follow up and also answer the question that came from somebody about the difficulties of assembling this book. When there was a very long list, I'll need another at least good hour to talk about it. But to say it quickly, going back to liberalism, uh, part of the ideology of liberalism is fear. Uh, and we are kept in structures of fear. And here, for many of us, there is fear in all the institutions we are in, in the state apparatus um, in which our lives are lived, and also on the global stage. There are uh, forces at work that make uh, everybody extremely wary and nervous about the words that are uttered and how they will be understood and what are the implications on each of us, our lives, our material lives. So it did take a lot of courage for each of my contributors to join and say what they have to say and for myself, all of us to collectively come together and speak uh, speak uh, in this way. It's not been easy. I, I just know that from, from all of our work together through the years. There's a question in the Q&A about yes. um, if this is going to be taught in any prison education programs or plan to discuss. And um, I thought I'd start with that, which is I've already sent, so I, I'm in contact with a number of people um, who are uh, in locked settings um, and I've already sent it to some of them. And uh, mostly the feedback is really fun because they're like, you must think I'm so smart. And I, I think back to a, a different talk that Reka gave about how, you know, oftentimes these insights, and, and Demita touched on this too, oftentimes the insights um, from people actively experiencing incarceration are so so breathtakingly brilliant that that I think that I keep telling them, no, like you informed this work and now please inform it with your critique, like please continue. So I think I I at least already am, am in dialogue with people in locked settings with this book and I, I'm sure that there is plans to do that um, elsewhere. Thank you, Autumn. Thank you for your enthusiasm and for your work. And I know you've been through so much in all the years and staying here with this project uh, and continuing the good work. Uh, um, yeah, I, I just go. wanted to um, say that I need to leave in, in exactly four minutes, but I just wanted to quickly go back to uh, Rekha's idea, um, which, sort of, which is structured around the um, concept of fear. Um, and Rekha and I have had several conversations uh, about how I feel fearful of having written this chapter, fearful of whose hands this chapter will end up being, um, uh, particularly when I embark on my travel back to India. Um, 
But at the same time, I'm also reminded of what Salman Rushdie said many years ago, that uh, one is very lucky to be living, he said it many years ago, one is very lucky to be living in the United States because you have the freedom to say what you want to say, because um, in, in retrospect, it, I'm not just sure to what extent I have that sense of freedom in, in this country. But I, I do believe that um, this, this kind of a critical conversation around uh, freedom uh, probably uh, can be articulated more so within the diaspora than in India. And so I've, I'm fortunate that I've got the opportunity to talk about this, to you know, articulate my ideas in this book. And I'll very much look forward to using some of the chapters in my course on human rights and resistance. Thank you. Thank you, Olga. We're getting good comments in the chat. Um, if there are thoughts and questions from my from my presenters here for one another. Uh, we've been together for so long and it's finally like to see some of my contributors here is amazing together. Wonderful. I know everybody's minds are full and hearts are heavy with everything that is going on in the world right now as well. So uh, it's just, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult time. I'm just grateful for all of you being here, the contributors and also the listeners. Yeah, someone just posted a question about how um, we can connect this to Angela Davis's uh, internationalist liberation movement concepts and um, in thinking about uh, Palestinian liberation right now. Um, so I just want to read that out in case anyone feels particularly compelled to, to answer that challenging <laughs> question. Well, in the last minute we have left, can I just add something? I Can you hear me? I don't yes, I never we tell. Can hear you. We can I just want to say really quickly, someone sent me uh, a text on WhatsApp today and she actually is writing about the situation in the Sahel what's happening in Israel, Palestine, and also what's happening in Indonesia. There are things that are happening, of course, all over the world that are connected, but we don't always, always know them. And she's compiling right now. She says there's a real need for us to recognize when you're in the midst of this kind of trauma and harshness, you have to continue working where you are and where you stand in your own tiny, humble way. Because she said, you know, so much of what's going on is overwhelming. And we get, you know, lost in our minds thinking that we're supposed to be performing these acts. In fact, the acts to perform are the ones that we do most passionately in these regards. The end. <laughs> Thank you, Demita. Yeah, it's... Mm. Oh, it's two. <laughs> We have Olka is checking out. Um, All right. So. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Yeah, thank, you. thank you, Heather, yes, for thank your you. work. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, Heather, yes. <laughs> wonderful. Thank yeah, you, everyone. Job. This has been a really wonderful conversation. Um, I'm going to go ahead and drop in the chat the discount code um, so that you can get 40% on the book. Um, you'll also get an email tomorrow that will have both the discount code in it um, and a link to our YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of this event. Um, but yeah, thank you again for this wonderful conversation and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Goodbye thank everyone. You. Bye everybody. Thank Thanks you everyone. All.